Amen. It will be good to have him back. Very good. And then I can let him take care of everything. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to begin this morning with prayer, if you'll join me, please. Father God, we are so thankful that you choose to speak into our lives, and so I offer myself before you and just help me to get out of your way, um, that these words would be your words and, and that we would hear what you want us to hear this morning. So open up hearts and minds. May your Holy Spirit be abundant among us, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, J.P. Smith talked about our individual calling, whether it be in the church or outside of the church or a little bit of both. We are all called. We all have a purpose. I, I got a strong word from God last night, and so I wrote it down word for word. You are made with purpose for a purpose, right? You are made with purpose for a purpose. Everyone on earth right now has a purpose before God that you have been created for. And he calls you into that, and he equips you with that, and he's going to work it out for you no matter what. He gives you exactly what you need for that moment in time. So we need to trust in him. So we are made for a purpose, and we're uh, a church full of different individuals, but we also have a corporate calling. Right? We are a group as As Asbury Church with the 8 o'clock service, the 9.30 Sunday school, our Wednesday night activities, Thursday morning Bible studies, things going on all week. This is a corporate calling for us. We have a purpose as well for why we are all here. And this is a biblical uh, example, uh, or we follow a biblical example. For example, when the Israelites came together and followed Moses to the promised land, that was a corporate calling. When the Israelites were brought together under David and Solomon, that was a corporate calling. The early church in Acts is a corporate calling. We were always intended to be in fellowship with one another for a purpose that was going to be to God's glory. And so this morning we are going to talk about our corporate calling. And for this morning's example, just to make an example out of the Bible, we're going to stick with uh, the Israelites' journey out of Egypt into the Promised Land. So this starts in Exodus 4. Just before that in Exodus, Moses is called by the burning bush, right? And Moses felt a little bit like J.P. and myself. Remember last week J.P. said he just kind of closed the email and was hoping that that would be it. And I felt the same way about 20 years ago. One of our pastors in Longmont, Colorado came to me and he said, it is time for you to preach to the congregation. <laughs> no, it is not. And Moses was the same way, right? He goes, Lord, I just, I can't speak well. I'm not a very learned person. I stutter. Surely you can find someone else to do this. And God said, Moses, I have given you every need, everything you need for the task at hand. So finally Moses got it, and he was obedient. And that's important to see that throughout the Bible, it's stories about people choosing to be obedient to what God is calling them to, because that's a choice. And so Moses was choosing to be obedient. He was told to go meet Aaron and to gather all the leaders of the Israelites in Egypt. And remember, before this, um, the Israelites had been living in Egypt because of Joseph. And what he'd done. So Joseph, there was famine in the land. And all the Israelites went to Egypt to get food. They settled there. They got along really well for a while. And then things started to not go as well. And they started crying out to God that they would be saved from their enslavement. So folks, remember, this is like a period of 400 years, right? So a couple hundred years were going well. But when they started crying out to God, it wasn't just for a couple weeks or a couple months or even a couple decades. It was for about a couple hundred years. And so God has heard their call and is gathering them together. And in Exodus 4, chapter, tw uh, chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, it says, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. 
And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worship. Thank you, Lord. You have seen our plight. You're going to rescue us from the Egyptians, and our prayers are answered. And so Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and he says, God is telling you to let his people go. You need to let them go into the desert for three days to worship their God. And Pharaoh goes, huh? Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He said, you know what? If you have three days to go worship your God, then you guys aren't working hard enough, and we're going to take all the straw away from the Israelites as they build the bricks for the Egyptians. Remember, that was the Israelites' job They had to build the bricks so that they could build temples and palaces and pyramids and everything they needed. And without straw, I know, isn't it crazy? I know this. Living in New Mexico with adobe, you know how to build a brick, funnily enough. Without straw, when the sand and the clay and the water dry out, everything falls apart. You you can't build a brick without straw. And Pharaoh is going to take the straw from them. So we find out then after the Israelites are so excited and they expected God to answer their prayers in a certain way, their response in Exodus chapter 5, 19 through 23 is this. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, and remember, that's without straw, so they had to produce the same amount. So when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Maybe a little overdone there, but sometimes we get a little overwrought in our prayers. It's not unusual. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh, you spoke. To speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. How quickly we turn around and go, what? That's not our prayer. That's not how we expected it to be answered. Are you serious? And remember, they go to Moses and Aaron and gripe, but who they're really griping at is God. How often do we do that? We turn around to someone we know, or we just need to let loose, and we go, you know, I can't believe it's like this. And you're really mad at God because he didn't do it exactly the way you thought it was going to be happening. So as we know, there are ten plagues, but things finally start to turn around for the Israelites. You know, there's frogs and there's blood in the water and hordes of locusts and some other stuff. And then finally God says, be prepared. This is it. He tells the Israelites, keep your shoes on your feet Put your cloaks on and tie them on you. Prepare a lamb. Put the blood of the lamb over your doorway so that the angel of the Lord will pass by you. And then make sure you eat all the lamb. Right? If you have too much lamb for your house, invite another family in. And be prepared. This is the night. And the angel of the Lord comes. The Egyptians experience that heart-wrenching death of their firstborn. And they're ready for the Israelites to go. They're like, we've had enough. Just leave. And not only does God send them with everything they have in their possession, the Israelites want out so badly that he blesses them beyond their imagination and the Egyptians give them gold and treasures and they're just like, just go. Take everything you can carry from us and go. And their prayers are answered. And they go out with singing and rejoicing and they get to the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh has changed his mind. And he's thinking, you know, we really need all those Israelites to keep working for us. And he starts to come after him. And so once again, it repeats themselves. They go to Moses and they go, did you just bring us to the edge of the Red Sea to have us die? (laughs) And Moses goes, no, the Lord is going to carry you through the sea. And the sea parted and they cross over the Red Sea. The Egyptians are destroyed when the Red Sea comes back together. They have manna, and they get quail when they are tired of manna. God takes care of all their needs, and they get to the edge of the promised land. It's the promised land. It's been promised to them by God. And they go, well, hang on, God. Can we just ask you one more thing? We would really like to send some folks in to spy out the land and tell us what it's really going to be like when we get there. 
And so God agrees. He's so gracious and merciful with us when we do not trust him. And he says, okay, send one leader from each tribe. Remember, there are 12 tribes of Israel. So one leader from each tribe goes in and spies out the land. Two come back, Caleb and Joshua, and they go, it's wonderful. There's so much produce. There's more than you can eat. There's great land for farming and for all of our livestock. This is it. There's room for all of us to spread out. This is fantastic. God has truly blessed us. The other ten, the other ten, tell anyone they will meet, there's just no way. There's no way we can do this. There's giants in the land. There's too many other people. They're going to destroy us. There's more than them than there are of us. What are we thinking? And so God turns them around. Hear what, what happens in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 26 through 40. Did you find it, Cain? I, I, God cut some of this out, so I want to be sure we're in the same place. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. So, okay, the Anakites are like looking at me at 5'2", and then one of those basketball players that's like almost 7 foot. You know, just they were giants in the land. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. This is Moses speaking. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you, will fight for you, as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes, and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God, who went ahead of you on your journey, in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard that you had said this, he was angry and solemnly swore, no one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, You shall not enter it either, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to inherit it. And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Folks, this happens 11 days after they leave Egypt. We so often get caught up in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that we forget that they were given the opportunity to enter the promised land 11 days after they left Egypt. And they got so scared and they let their fear overrule them that God said, enough. This generation cannot enter 40 days or 40 years in the desert. Remember, Moses only even gets to look out over it, and once he passes away, then they can go in and enter it. What should have taken 11 days takes 40 years because they refuse to trust God and take him at his word. Because we do not want to be like them. We want to see what the consequences are when we do trust God God, or the benefits are when we trust God, and what the consequences are when we don't. And to do that well, we want to be sure of the biblical definition of trust, right? Not what we think we know, but what the Bible tells us we need to know. So to do that, I got out a book called Mounce's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. Can you tell that that's a theology book from the university? But I am very thankful that someone did all that research, so I don't have to. (laughs) So trust in the Old Testament is based on two words, aman 
and batah. The first, a man, means to believe and or trust. The second, batah, is to trust, rely on, and or depend on with a sense of being completely confident and feeling utterly safe. The Israelites stood at the edge of the promised land and they were not confident and they did not feel safe. They were behaving contrary to who they needed to be. And it took the 40 years in the desert before they came to understand that the Old Testament believers needed to trust God as one of the key characteristics that would make them a person or a part of the community of the believers of Israelites. Trusting God was going to be the characteristic that made them different from everyone around them. They did not trust in wealth, power, or intelligence. They did not trust him only in the good times. Truly trusting in God meant leaning into him, especially when circumstances were difficult. Anyone else dealing with something difficult this morning? I think we all are. I look around, and I know that we all have different things going on. And so I want to point you towards Psalm 56 this week. If you want to hear words of trusting God despite what the circumstances are, Psalm 56 speaks very, very clearly to this. And we do not want to have the same consequences that they had. By not trusting God, that blessing is taken from an entire generation of people. But thankfully, we are New Testament believers, and in the New Testament, the word for trust is pistuo, and it means to believe, be convinced of something, and to have faith in God or Christ. We want to choose to be a corporate group of believers who trust our God. We want to receive those benefits that are promised to us. And one of the first and most important benefits is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And I'm going to stop there for just a sec. Remember, the ruler of the kingdom of the air is Satan or the devil or the enemy of your soul, whatever words you use for him, but that's the ruler of this world. And we were all in that place where our sin led us to follow him instead of God. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heaven, heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, thank God. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created with purpose, for purpose, and through salvation, God will work that purpose out through you. Not because of who you are or what you've done, but because of how he loves us and the abundant grace he pours out on us. What wonderful good news. We were never meant to do this by ourselves. We were always meant to do it with the strength of who God is in Jesus Christ and find salvation. Another benefit is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, when it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That reflects what it says in what we just read in Ephesians, where it says that, um, And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. We are children of God. 
How does that change your outlook for what might be coming this week? Children of the Most High God, we have been given a place of benefit and privilege that just cannot be fathomed. He holds more for us than we can possibly imagine. Jesus himself also, t- also tells us in John 10, 10, The thief comes to only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to, to the full. The full here is translated literally abundant life. Abundant life. Not eh life. Not blah life. Abundant life. Not just sort of some of life. Abundant life. More than your heart can hold. And just a few things that are included in that abundant life are found in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust or believe in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In that little short verse, you have joy, you have peace, you have hope, you have the power of the Holy Spirit working out in your life. That's abundance. That's abundance. And remember, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was something that was you picked and choose, right? Moses had the Holy Spirit on him. Aaron had the Holy Spirit. David did. Solomon did. The prophets did. But in the New Testament understanding, once you give Christ your life, you have access to the Holy Spirit. You have access to that hope, to that joy, to that peace in abundance and that love. What love has he lavished on you? I promise you he is lavishing to look for it. You do have to open your eyes and want to see it working out in your life. And if he has so much for us individually, how much more does he have for us as a corporate body of Christ? How much more we can, can we say to anyone, anyone who walks in this place, who is living in death and in sin the way we were before we chose Christ? Because there, there's, not, there's not a wishy-washy area in there. You choose Christ and have abundant life, or you are tied to sin and death. There's no in-between. And so anyone who has walked in here and needs that, we give that to them, right? We offer grace and forgiveness to each other because it's first been given to us. We offer it to anyone out there, whether they look like us or not, because it's first been given to us. We offer his love, his salvation, his hope to those who are hurting. We have folks in here who literally work at God because he can do that through us. We have folks here who work to comfort others because that's the gift that they have been given. We have folks who work tirelessly just to even set up and tear down rooms so that we can fellowship here like believers should. We have our praise team who helps us to worship and sing out our praise to God. Right? We need everyone. We are called to corporate worship and corporate fellowship because it takes all of us to show everyone out there who doesn't have Jesus what living in Christ really looks like. But we have to choose it. We have to choose it. We have to be praying for each other and asking God to bless what we are doing here. We have to be praying for Pastor Rick because he is about to walk through a crucible that we cannot envision yet. February is going to be rough. But remember, we don't want to be like the Israelites. We are not going to turn back from what is happening because of fear. We will not. Because we claim Christ. And so we're going to pray over Rick. And we're going to pray him into this. And then we're going to also pray that he receives a vision of what comes next for us as Asbury, as a body of believers. 
And we're going to pray that we all come together and follow where Rick is leading. Folks, I cannot tell you how blessed we are to have a pastor who listens to God and seeks what is best for this church in glory to God. There are a lot of pastors out there who after February are going to be left wandering, and it breaks my heart. But we have Rick, and we are blessed. You want to lift him up. I am thankful that no matter what happens in February, God has got this. He has got us because we are going to choose to follow him. Because we are going to choose to continue to declare that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior and the Son of God. We are going to choose to continue to bring messages each Sunday that use the word of God. That we can speak truth into lives. We are going to continue to offer that salvation, that hope, that comfort, that peace, that joy, no matter what, because we can cling to God through his Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. This is what we have. We are at the edge of our promised land, and God is calling us to lean into him and trust him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to pray with me and then to vocalize your amen with me because it's as a corporate amen, it's a body of Christ amen that we will continue to follow him with all we are. Let's go before the Lord. Father God, we are so humbled that you find us useful, that you give us purpose, and that you are working out all things for our good. And so we are going to claim the victory for you. We are going to give you the glory no matter what happens in the next few months and weeks to come. And we are going to lift up our pastor before you. We ask that you would give Rick a very clear vision of what comes for Asbury. We are going to choose to be obedient. We are going to choose to follow your will, and we are going to choose to trust you. Lord, take us forward into our promised land so that you will be glorified and that those who need you so desperately in this world will see you and find salvation for themselves. Allow us, Lord, to continue to be your light, your life. Lord, work out your calling in us individually and as a body of Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty and victorious name. And we say together, Amen. Amen.